want to turn to Matthew chapter 2. As you know, most Christmas messages come from Luke chapter 2, right? You've heard it over and over again. Uh, Charlie and I talked about this a couple weeks ago and how he, he gave a message one Sunday where he talked about Bible prophecy. So we're going to do something similar to that today, although we're going to call over the story in Matthew chapter 2, but it's going to have a little bit of a different slant or, or look to it than what we, you would normally do. So, so let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 22. I'll have the slides up here for you to look at too, but we'll go ahead and go through this. I titled this A Light in the Darkness. When I was like 19 years old and I was in the U.S. Army, the military, I was stationed over in Germany, a little town called Dunsen, Germany. I was stationed with an artillery detachment. There was about 40 of us. I was in what was called the Signal Corps Electronics. I was a radio operator, radio repairman. So I sat in this little radio station about the size of this room, and I answered radios. Now, being a private at the time, we had three shifts. This was a 24-hour operation. The two sergeants worked the day from 8 to 4. I worked from 4 to midnight. Then sometimes work from midnight to 8 in the morning. But I remember when I worked from 8, from 4 to midnight, getting off at midnight. Now, being in the signal site, we, didn't, we, weren't, we weren't required to stay in the barracks. We could live in German housing. So I lived in this little German-like house apartment called the Land House. And this was just an itty-bitty town in Germany. We were on the outskirts. And if at midnight, I had to walk just a little over a mile to get to the place where I stayed. And when it was cloudy, there was no street lights. It was pitch black. I'd put my hand up like this, and I couldn't even see my hand. I'd be walking, and something would scurry in front of me, and, and I'd think, is that a, is that a raccoon? Is that a, some uh, porcupine? If it was a skunk, I would have known, right? Because <laughs> you would have smelt it. But it was so dark, I'd walk on this old cobblestone road until I finally got close enough to this uh, little hotel apartment that I lived in, which was a one room that I had, and we had to use the uh, restroom out in the hallway, which you could lock the door on, obviously. But I would see that light, and I'd think, wow, I'm finally getting there. Now, every night wasn't like that. But do you remember times in the dark, yourself being scared as a kid, thinking there's a goblin under your bed or in the closet or something? And so we're afraid of the dark. But Jesus Christ came to this world as the light of this world. In fact, in John chapter 8 and in John chapter 9, Jesus said he was the light of the world. He also says that in Matthew chapter 5, that he's the light of the world. But Jesus Christ right now went to heaven, and he's at the right hand of God, right? Now, who's to be the light of the world? We are. We hear it over and over again. We're to be the light of the world, we're to be the salt of the world, right? So he left us in that responsibility. We're to be the light of the world right now. So this is a light in the darkness. He was that light. He came back in the early first century, was born as a baby, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, it says that Jesus is the bright and morning star. And we look forward to that bright and morning star coming back. I know there's sometimes people think, well, hey, I want to live my life. I want to have children. I want to get married. I hear people saying that. In fact, when I taught at a Sunday school at another church, this guy says, I don't want Christ to come back yet because I want to have children. Well, there's nothing wrong with thinking that. But I'll tell you what, God knows us. And when we get to heaven, we're not going to be disappointed that he came back and got us. And as you get older, they say you look more forward to it. And I have to agree with that. And that's because we understand things and we're aches and pains and we know that we're not young and we don't experience the things that we do as a younger person. So I'm saying we should look forward to him coming back no matter what age we are. But let's go ahead and talk about this and see in the birth of Jesus. We'll read these verses in a minute, but I want to kind of give you a background first about the prophecies that led up to Christ being born in um, Bethlehem. So back in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, we won't have to turn there, but Malachi 3, 1, which is wrote, written in approximately 475 B.C. Now between the closing of the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, there's like 400 years. You know what the years are called? The 400 silent years, because there's no evidence or anything of any book or any prophets or anything during that time period. And I think right now, sometimes we can look at the 2,000 years from the death of Christ to now and call them, the 2000, call them the silent years, right? And I'll talk about this a little more later, because sometimes we all look and think, where is God? He's not here. He doesn't answer me, and I don't know what's going on. And that's what they did with the 400 silent years, because until Christ came and was born, they went through that 400 years from the closing of the Old Testament. So in Malachi 3, 1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger. Now, who was that messenger? That was John the Baptist, right? John 1.29, he says, Behold the Son of God who taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said that he was the messenger. Then he says, And he will prepare the way before me, talking about Christ the Messiah, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. 
So that is a prophecy in the Old Testament that talks about Jesus Christ coming, and he will go to his temple. Now, we know when Jesus was born, eight days later, he went to the temple and was circumcised and was blessed and so on, right? And now let's, let me share with you about these temples. The very first temple Israel had was Solomon's temple. Now, Solomon was very wise and very wealthy, right? There's nothing wrong with wealth if you know how to handle it. But he built the first temple, or had it built, in 1000 B.C. 400 years later, it was destroyed in 600 B.C., and that was by the Babylons. The Babylons came in, overran Israel, um, killed them all, destroyed everything, carried away the elite. Remember Daniel? Uh, carried him to Babylon. Later on, came back and they carried a guy named Ezekiel to Babylon. So he was in a Babylon also. So these guys, the elite of Israel was carried off to Babylon. Israel was decimated. It was no nation anymore at all. But there was a prophecy in the Old Testament that said that when Israel would be released to go back to Israel, the Jews would be released and to go back and they could build the wall and they could build the temple and so on and so on. So we'll talk about that here just in a second. But that was Solomon's temple. It was destroyed after 400 years. Then when they came back to Israel after the Babylon captivity, they rebuilt the temple. A guy named Zerubbabel, who was there in Babylon with them, he built that temple, and that was 500 B.C. approximately. Now, he never really truly, this was never truly completed the way it should have been. And it's called Zerubbabel's temple. So back when Jesus was born and Herod the king was over Israel, the Roman Empire put Herod over this area, Herod beautified this temple. And so it became known as Herod's temple. He beautified it and finished it completely. Now this temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the general, uh, by the Romans when General Titus came in there and it says, you know, this destroyed it and burnt it down completely in 70 AD. So since 70 AD there's been no temple in Israel. But this temple, the second temple, which we call Zerubbabel's temple or Herod's temple, is basically the one that Jesus was involved with during his time on this earth. So we know there's going to be a temple during the uh, tribulation time period, which is the seven years tribulation that's going to come upon this world, and I believe we're getting closer. And this temple is, be, is prepared to be built right now. If you go to the website that I've mentioned before, www.templeinstitute.org, it's a Jewish Hebrew um, website, and there's a little icon up at the right hand corner. I think it's in the right hand corner. You can click on it for English because otherwise it's in Hebrew. And you can clip on this web, click on this website called the Temple Institute, and you can read all about it. They even have stuff they sell in there, all kinds of Jewish stuff. They even have something, a little a plaque of uh, Donald Trump in there. Look in there. It's kind of interesting. They like Donald Trump. They did. And so it's, go to that Temple Institute and look at it. It's, it's fascinating. But they are prepared to build this temple. All they have to do is get the go-ahead. And they will build it on the Temple Mount. Now, the problem on the Temple Mount right now is the Muslims have their mosque on there, right? So something has to be worked out. But I have an idea how that will be. So that's something to see how that gets worked out. But that will be a temple that will be built at the start of the tribulation time period. The longest it's going to last is seven years because it's going to get destroyed during that tribulation time period. I don't believe this is a temple blessed by God because this is a temple built by the Jews out of unbelief. Now the next temple is going to be the temple after the seven year tribulation when the millennial kingdom starts. Millennial means a thousand. It will be a thousand years long. And Jesus Christ will bring this temple down to Jerusalem. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign in this temple which will last for a thousand years. Okay? And that's the temple that you and I are going to be involved with in Jerusalem as we go there and live as the Bible tells us. So that will be the third temple, or the fourth temple, actually, the third official temple, and there will be no more temple. At the end of the millennial kingdom of a thousand years, the Bible tells us in Second Peter that there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and it actually tells you in Revelation 21, verse 22, that Jesus Christ will be the temple for all eternity. Okay, so there will be no actual physical temple in eternity after the millennial kingdom. Revelation 21, 22 tells us that Jesus Christ will be that temple. So that's fascinating about the temples. But let's go ahead and continue on in this. You all know the verse Isaiah 9, 6. You hear that all the time. Um, is it Linus that quotes this verse in the Charlie Brown show? And this verse says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his soul, shoulder, and on, I can't say shoulder, on and on and on, right? That's Isaiah 9, 6. Another prophecy of the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Then there's a, that was written somewhere around 700 B.C. And then there's another one from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, is the one we're going to look at as we look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. They quote this verse as a paraphrase. And Micah 5, 2 says this. This was written around 700 years before the birth of Christ also. Amazing. And it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, 
Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. It talks about the common Messiah from old to everlasting, and this Messiah, Jesus, is from everlasting, from beginning to end. He's eternal. He's the eternal God. He's the Omega, right? Alpha and Omega. That's Jesus. So these three prophecies predict that Jesus would come. So the Jewish people must have kind of had an idea that someday this Messiah was going to come, right? Now, at the close of the Old Testament, with the completion of the book of Malachi, they waited these 400 years, and all of a sudden, these wise men appeared in Jerusalem and said, we've seen a star, and we're coming here to look for this Jesus, who's to be the king of the Jews. And so Herod wasn't too excited about that. But Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 26 Here's the fascinating thing, and I mentioned this before. The 70 weeks of Daniel, which actually work out to each week is a is year, so it actually works out to 70 times 7, 490 years. We know the last 490 years is going to be the seven-year tribulation, and between that is the church age. But back, if you calculate this out, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 5, if you want to write that down or read it, I think I have it in your paper. But Nehemiah chapter 2 there's a decree lived, given when they left Babylon that they can go back and rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And it says in Daniel when that decree is given to go back and build Jerusalem is the start of the 483 years. And it took 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem. And then the remaining is up and it says the Messiah would be cut off. What do you think cut off means? In the book of Daniel, cut off means killed, died. That was the Jewish terminology for somebody dying. So the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, says actually this Messiah who would come 483 years after this decree that was given in Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, that he would be cut off, killed, the Messiah. And some people probably understood this. Many of them didn't. And that was the Messiah. And here's what's fascinating about this. If you calculate this out, now this is difficult. I've calculated this out before. A guy named Sir Robert Anderson, which some of you may have heard of, and other geniuses, a lot smarter than I am, have gone through and taken our Gregorian calendar and the Jewish calendar, which, remember, the A.D. and B.C. started after Christ, okay? Before then, it was a different type calendar. And the Jewish years was, a year was 360 days, our years are 365. So you have to take this all into account. So these 483 years, when they calculate it out, it comes out to 173,880 days. Now, if you work them into Jewish years and you go to that date, which they can, historians can go back and say that that decree was given by Nehemiah back in March 5th, 444 B.C., and you add the years to it, you know when it comes out to? March 30th, 33 A.D. That blows me away. When I first read this and I studied this, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. If, that, if, apology, if, if prophecy doesn't prove the Bible, I don't know what it does, because that just amazes me. And I'm going to go through this in detail in the spring when we go through the book of Revelation, so you all understand it. Because right now it's all like, it's pretty heavy. It really is. But it's, it's pretty cool to think about that. They actually gave a prophecy in the Old Testament when the Messiah would die on the cross, be cut off. So I found that fascinating, March 30th, 33 A.D. And you think about that. Now, some of these people must have known this. So there probably was rumors that were going around that, hey, the Messiah is going to come some, sometime this time period. There's some people must have had an idea, right? Um, here's the thing, though. They only had the Old Testament. Not everybody had the Old Testament. They're not like us where we have four or five Bibles in our home, right? <laughs> I mean, back then, they had to listen to the scribes in, during the, their services or anything they could read or understand. So not the common people really didn't have too much of an understanding, but some did. And I'm sure some people were waiting for this because they knew about this prophecy. The sad thing is the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were basically filled with apathy and they didn't really care. So let's go ahead and look at this next slide. And from silence to salvation, let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 1, verse 2. Starting in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. So the wise men must have had an idea. Now the east was the Babylonian area. And isn't it interesting that God had providentially had the Jews go to Babylon when they were destroyed because they rebelled against them, and yet Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and so on during this time period, the people in Babylon, seeing all the miracles that Daniel did that happened there during that time, remember Daniel in the lion's den and those that were in throwing the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and 
bit and ago were thrown in the uh, fire pit and so on, and they survived. A lot of things, amazing things happened in Daniel, and it must have got people to pay attention. So these guys had to be somewhere from that idea, and they must have had an idea of this. And so they saw this star, and this was like a four-month trip from the Babylon area to Jerusalem. So they made this trip, and they arrived. Now, we all look at this as being three wise men because of the three gifts, the gold, mirror, and frankincense, but it wasn't three wise men. They believe it was probably a, of an entourage of maybe up to 100 people that actually came. And we call them three kings. We sing the song, Three Kings of Orient Art. It wasn't three kings either. They, they, were, they were astrologers or philosophers is the best way to look at it, I think. So there was an expectation that this Messiah would be born somewhere around this time period. They were expecting it, and all of a sudden these guys showed up there, as we've seen in, Dan, in Matthew 2, verse 1 and 2. And so... First of all, this prophecy said that he would be cut off, so he has to be born first, right? So they had to look for his birth first, and so the birth had to be before he was born. So that's why during this time period, there may have been some that knew about this and that were excited about it. I don't know. I wasn't there. But anybody that studied the Bible, and you and I, we criticize people sometimes back then in the days, but if you just had the Old Testament, you studied it, would you come up with this? It's difficult. I mean, we have sometimes difficulty studying the New Testament but knowing what's going on. So, but anyways, it says in verse 1, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. And this, according to the calendar, was probably around 4 B.C. And that may come to a shock to some of you, but that's when they calculated out. It probably was 4 B.C. when he was actually born because we created our calendar incorrectly and scholars have gone back and studied that and find out that he was probably born somewhere around then. Does it really matter if they're right or wrong? I don't know. I, to me it doesn't matter. I believe he was born. I believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. But it's, there were signs given in Matthew chapter 16, as you remember, when Jesus was an adult, he went to the, he was with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he says, you guys, you understand by looking at the sky that tomorrow's going to be sunny, Tomorrow it's going to rain, tomorrow it's going to be windy, whatever. But you don't even know your Bible, your Old Testament, about the Messiah, Jesus, that he came. You don't even comprehend that. And so Jesus was frustrated with them. But he was born in Bethlehem of Ogea, of Judea. And this book of Micah that we just talked about is called a minor prophet. It's minor not because of importance, but because it was shorter. It was only seven chapters. It talked about judgment and in hope. And the hope here is the coming Messiah. And it describes his birthplace precisely. Now understand this, there was, two actually, there was actually two Bethlehems in, in Israel at the time. There was Bethlehem of um, Galilee, which is sometimes called Bethlehem of Zebulun. Then there was Bethlehem of Judea, which in the book of Micah calls it Ephratah. So that was a small town about five miles south of Jerusalem where it was prophesied that the Messiah would be born. And we're going to see that God providentially worked this out. Remember, Caesar Augustus sent out this decree. Now, Joseph had to go back to um, his hometown. Joseph was living up in Nazareth, and he had to travel that 90-mile trip with a very pregnant wife. I'm about to have a baby. Would you imagine how that would be? Riding a donkey. They say it took about five days or longer for them to travel from, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And they made that trip. And he had to make it because Caesar Augustus said, you have to go to your city of your birth because there's going to be a census and you have to, we have to calculate this out to figure out how you're going to be taxed. So God worked that out. Th these weren't silent years. God worked all this stuff out through these people and he's doing things today too. So they went back there and Herod was the king at this time. Now let me tell you a little bit about Herod that's interesting. Herod was a half Jew. Do you remember Abraham had a son named Isaac? Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, right? And what did it say about Rebekah that she had two what's in her womb? Two nations. That the na she had Esau and she had Jacob. Jacob's name became changed to Israel, right? So Jacob became Israel. He became the nation of Israel. Esau became the nation of Edom. And he was an Edomite, or what they call the Idumeans. What do you think Herod was? Herod was an Edomite. He was an Idumean. He was a half Jew. Isn't it funny when Jacob... When Esau was born first, he was the firstborn, should have had the inheritance. And it says Jacob was holding his heel when he came out. They were fighting in the womb. And they came out, and later on, as they were young adults, Esau was out in the uh, hunting out in the woods, and he came back, and he was hungry, and he goes to Jacob. He says, give me some of that stew you made. So Jacob was kind of a mama's boy. He stayed home and did stuff, whereas Esau was kind of the, the manly type out hunting and stuff. And Jacob said, hey, give me your birthright, and I will give you some of my stew. So he said, I don't care, I'll give you my birthright. Now later on, you know that they tricked 
that Rebekah and Jacob tricked their father Isaac and made it look like Jacob because Isaac had, was blind and he was old and he couldn't understand and he blessed Jacob. So, so Jacob kind of us usurped the position, but God wanted him to have it anyways. And that's what's fascinating. So Jacob was where Jesus came from, wasn't he? Jesus, Jesus came from the lineage of um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through the lineage of Daniel. And so Jesus was the true king, wasn't he? Whereas Herod was the actual usurper at that time. So I find that very fascinating when you think about that. Um, look at verse 2, it says, saying, Where is he who has born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The wise men, which were called the Magi or the Magos, um, it means uh, star followers. Now, I personally believe that this was not what some people like Jehonas, Kepler, and others say it was a lineup of Uranus and Venus and a, we had a bright sky and, a, and they followed that. Now, you look up in the star. Is that going to lead you to anything? No. I personally believe it was a supernatural star, possibly an angel that God, or something that God created that led these men. And the first place they went to was Jerusalem. And they asked, hey, the star led us here. Who we, where is this Jesus? So I believe it was supernatural. And they said they wanted to go there to give him homage to worship him. So let's go ahead and look at our next slide and we'll see verses 3 and 4 of Matthew chapter 2. So Matthew chapter 2 verse 3 says this, when Herod the king heard of this, he was troubled. He was troubled all right. And all Jerusalem with him, because if Herod was, had a problem, then the other people are going to be have a problem too. And verse 4, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So that's verse 3 and 4. Herod was a political genius. He was somebody that had everything under control during his time. He became king at a young age, maybe in his late 20s, 30 years old. He was king for maybe 30-some years. He actually died in about 4 B.C., the year Jesus was born, shortly after that. He died, and he was a wicked, wicked, manipulative man. He crushed a rebellion which, which within three years of anything that was going on. So the Roman government was happy with him because he brought, made peace, right? It kind of sounds like what the Antichrist is going to do <laughs> to think about it. But he beautified the temple. He uh, helped build Masada. Uh, there's another place that he worked on too. But he, he did a lot of great, wonderful things. But he was an evil man. He was an egomaniac. Um, he, he was so wicked. He was so paranoid that he killed his own wife, Miriam. He also killed three of his sons. He killed his brother. And anybody that thought he thought was a threat, he killed. He just got rid of them. In fact, when he knew he was going to die, he gave, told his, all the leaders, he said, I think it was like 100 to 120 people. He says, I want all these people killed when I die so that people remember when I died. I mean, what a wicked, self-centered guy, right? But that was Herod. Now, Caesar Augustus said, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it's claimed that Caesar Augustus said that it's better to be Herod's pig than to be his son because you're more likely to live. I mean, what a horrible man. So look at verse 3. It says there, Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Now in all Jerusalem with him. Now why would all Jerusalem be troubled? Because they better be very, very careful, these scribes and Pharisees, about getting excited about this Messiah, because Herod's going to have their head cut off, right? I mean, they had to follow. This guy was what you call a dictator. I mean, he was bad. And so he was troubled. Everybody else was troubled. Then in verse 4 it tells us, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes together, he inquired of them where the Christ would be born. Now, why did he want to know where the Christ would be born? He wanted to get rid of them, right? He didn't want any threats. And that's why he really did this. So let's go ahead and look at the next verses, which is verses, the next four verses. And this will be verses uh, 5 through 8. And I've got a little picture of Bethlehem there. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 2 of Matthew. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. Now this is taken from the Old Testament, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It's a paraphrase of Micah 5, 2. Not exact word by word. But verse 6 says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And they sent him to Bethlehem and said, Go and search careful for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. So they quoted Micah 5 2. They knew the Old Testament enough to know that where the Messiah would be born. Incredible, right? Now, they were apathetic with a capital A because they didn't care. They didn't want to go with the, the 
wise men to find Jesus, did they? They stayed right there, but they had an idea. And the interesting thing I find here is they interpreted the Bible uh, literally, too, for what it said. You know, so there's some good things here. Now, this Bethlehem, which was the one that was south of Jerusalem, about five miles, the population, they say, at that time was probably only like 300 people. It was pretty small for the Savior to be born there. It was called the City of David because that's where David was, right? And I think it was Rachel that was buried there. And so, and this is where Joseph was from, so he had to take um, his wife Mary back there. But Jerusalem at this time was somewhere around 50,000 or more. It was the big city. It was the big metropolis. So they went this 90 miles to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born. And in verse 5 it says, So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this it is written. Then in verse 6 it talks about this Bethlehem from the Old Testament. Now verse 5, Herod heard this. It's time for him to implement damage control. He did not want this to get out because he did not want the people looking for another king. Because he was king. So he had to do something to shut these people out. Um, they, these people, these Pharisees, these scribes, they cared more about Herod's disposition than they cared about what God thought. Let's not be that way, right? Sometimes we get caught up in how man looks at us, mankind, or people look at us and we're afraid. And we really should have the fear and respect of God more than we should have the fear of mankind. But these people were afraid of Herod. And it says in verse 6 that he would be a ruler and he would be a shepherd. And we know Jesus is going to be king. He was a shepherd there when he was these three three years that were during his ministry that he led these people. And verse 7, it says, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, notice he secretly called them, determined from them what time the star appeared. When the, when the wise men from the east saw the star, he kind of, when did this appear? And so he kind of calculated it out, and he thought, okay, to find this Jesus, I'm going to have to do something to kill a certain amount of people within a certain date range or time range. And so that's why, as you see in verse 16, it says, look at verse 16 of chapter 2. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, because the wise men had a dream, and they didn't go back to Jerusalem to talk to this Herod guy. They, they knew better, but they had a dream, said, don't go back. And Herod, when he was, saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined the wise men. So I believe he did a little bit of a deviation or variation. Said, if I kill all the male boys two years and younger, it should wipe out this Jesus guy that they said is going to be born king of the Jews. The thing is, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary escaped to Egypt at that time, right? So they were safe. But what a horrific thing to do. Can you imagine to go and kill all these? Can you imagine the mothers and fathers to have their sons killed at that age, that young? I mean, extremely painful extremely awful thing to do. But in verse 8 it says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Well, he was a hypocrite. He didn't want to worship anything. He wasn't planning on having a baby shower unless you consider a bloodbath because that's what he did. He went and killed all these babies. He didn't want truth. So that tells me today when we read this and we think about this and we kind of put ourselves back in that time period, are we looking for truth? Do we want truth? Or are we just going through the motions of Christianity and saying whatever happens, happens? Because that's what they kind of did back then. But we need to have truth. Um, there was not a lot of searching for truth that you could see in the Bible back in them days because Jesus was kind of, kind of frustrated when he did his ministry, right? And tried to talk to these people. But today, you don't hear much about this stuff in churches either. And it, it's kind of sad. Remember when Jesus stood before Pilate at the crucifixion in John chapter 18, verse 38? And Jesus said he was the truth, and Pilate said, what is truth? Sneeringly, like, there's no truth. There's, and yet, I'm going to tell you today, this Bible, this book, is the Word of God. It's inspired. It is truth. And I, the more I study it, the more I see that, the more it blows me away, the more it amazes me. I mean, it's just a, such a fascinating book. And so today, we need to make sure that we are seriously searching for truth. But let's go ahead and look at verse 9 and 10 here real quick. And as it shows there, the three wise men, which were actually probably about a hundred, but they were heading to Bethlehem. And in verse 9, it says, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. So they saw the star again, and it led them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Notice how excited these wise men were. Now think about this. These were Gentiles. And they were excited about this coming Messiah of the Jew, or this coming King of the Jews. Where were the Jews? 
Why weren't they excited? I mean, why was it some Jewish people saying this is the Messiah? Remember G Mary had the angel appear to her, tell her all about this? I mean, she, I, I'm not so sure she could have kept that quiet. She wasn't told people. But it looks like apathy. And we see that in our churches today. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it's called the Church of Laodicea. And I think this is the age we're in. In fact, Luke 18.8, 8, when Jesus returns, it says, Will I find faith on the earth? And that's kind of like, no, I won't find faith on the earth. And you know what he's saying. So here's the thing. They didn't really care either. But the supernatural star led up to them. And the calculation was Jesus was probably around one years old at this time. And so that's why Herod went and killed everybody younger than two to get rid of them. And in verse 10, I like the way it says there, when, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They were excited. Look at verse 16 again of Matthew chapter 2. Notice verse 16, when Herod was deceived, he said he was exceedingly angry. So one group of people that had the right attitude were joyful and excited. Another group of people that hated all this stuff was exceedingly angry, and that was Herod. So our response to Jesus today, there's three responses that we make today. We have indifference or apathy. We just go about our life. Whatever happens, happens. Uh, we have hostility like Herod did. You know, angry when somebody, you know somebody's a Christian, you see somebody's a Christian, they respond to him in an angry way. Or we worship and love him, as the wise men did and others did also, and as we should. So that's the three responses that people have today, too, just like they did back then. And that was 2,000 years ago. Now, I'm going to give you four groups of headings that have five signs or so five indicators or prophecy for today that you and I can look forward to. For. Because we look back then and we say they should have known because the Old Testament, Isaiah, Micah, Malachi all talked about Christ, Daniel talked about him, Nehemiah talked about him, so on and so on. And we say, well, they should have known, well, we should know also. So I'm going to give you five or four groupings of five signs each. And let's look at these. And I'll go through these pretty quick because I think these are fascinating. But first, when God is silent, is he really silent? Or are we just not paying attention? Which is it? I know there's people that have grown up and have some horrible situations. And people had some awful things happen to them. And they think, well, God can't be real because why does he allow this to happen? We are in a sin-filled world. It is a fallen world. Things are going to happen to you. The rain's going to come on the good and the bad. The sunshine's going to come on the good and the bad. Understand that. So if terrible things happen, that is not a reason to say God doesn't exist. He does exist. He does some pretty miraculous things. We all know of people that have miraculously been healed. Uh, Chris and I have a friend, uh, Cindy, who's a wife of my friend, Pastor uh, Rod Haller, down in um, Florida, Cape Corral. And she had cancer. It was real bad. And yet she's perfectly healed now. Very godly woman. And that's a miracle. And you all probably could tell me many miracles of things that have happened, that people have been healed, and, and God does work in this age today. Not all the time. God, you know, God allows certain people to live and certain people not to for certain reasons. I don't understand it, but he is in control. We just need to pay attention. So let's be careful about judging these people back in the first century, and let's look at the prophecies that are right before our very eyes that are developing right now, and we can understand these. So let's not be blind to these. And as this guy sitting on the dock... And possibly he's saying, where is God when I need him? Shouldn't we still be saying, actually, where am I when God needs me? He left us here for a reason. We're to be a light of the world. So where are we when God needs us? That convicts me, and it should convict us. But we should realize that, that we're here for God. So the first one we're going to look at is Israel. And there's five things that will happen to Israel in the last days. So let's go ahead and look at these. And I'll go through these real quick. Your insert has these in there. So, Israel. The miracle of Israel's survival. Do you know Abraham was called 4,000 years ago to go and be the father of the Jewish nation? And the book of Genesis, I think it's chapter 12, says that they will forever have this nation. It will always be the Jews. And as long as they obey God, they would occupy it. Now, they've been exiled twice. Back in 605 B.C., they were kicked out by the Babylonians. In fact... It was completely decimated, this whole country. They came back and they had to rebuild it again. And then in 70 AD, the Romans, General Titus, came in and destroyed them. They got scattered through the four corners of the earth. In fact, you know what? Israel's name was even changed that time. It was changed to Palestine. 
Even Jerusalem, the name of Jerusalem was changed to have no remnants or no vestige of this being a Hebrew Jewish nation. And yet, they are still here today. Look at the miracle. No other nation has, has this ever happened to. Um, the second one, so that one already has been fulfilled. The second one is Israel's enemies will be cursed. Um, if you look at the verses there, you'll look them up later and understand this. Um, I'll explain this later when we get into Revelation in a little more depth because I think this is something fascinating to understand. But these nations that went against Israel, God said they'd be destroyed, they'd never be, a, they'd never be again. And that includes the Moabites. Do you know of a nation called the Mo Moabites anymore? Okay, what about the Ammonites? There's a city in Jordan called Ammon. It's the capital of Jordan. That kind of reminds us that there used to be a nation called the Ammonites. But they're gone because they went against Israel. The Amalekites are gone. They went against Israel. Never came back again. The Edomites, which Herod was an Edomite, they're gone. There's no Edomites anymore, is there? Not at all. Philistines, they're gone. They were on the sea coast of the Mediterranean. Remember the famous Philistine was Goliath, J. David and Goliath? They're gone. There's no more Philistines. This is, this is, a, this is amazing. Okay, now Egypt was Israel's enemy also, but you know what? It says that Egypt would be spared, and yet, do we have a nation Egypt today? Yes, we do. Isn't that cool? I mean, the Bible's amazing. But then it says Israel will return in the last days. Israel will return in the last days, and these are the verses there. May 14th, 1948, against all odds, in fact, they were surrounded by troops that outnumbered them like a thousand to one, and Israel became a nation again. Harry Truman, who was a moderate Democrat, the President of the United States at that time signed off saying, I, I accept Israel as a nation again. And they accepted Israel. Israel was born in a day. Isaiah 66, verse 8. I don't know if I have this one written down on your paper. But this verse says that it's a miracle that Israel be born in a day. And they were born in a day. That is fascinating. They became a nation just like that. Went to war the second they were born, and they defeated the enemy that was surrounded them. A thousand to one. Um, so they, they came back. Um, back in 1890, there was a Christian guy named David Barron. He wrote a book, and he says, I don't understand how this can be. How can Israel come back when they're scattered all over the world? And yet it was fulfilled. David Barron believed that, but it actually happened, didn't it? I mean, that's amazing. Then it says here, the very last one, Israel will build a third temple. We kind of talked about this already. They will have a temple, and they have it prepared. If you go to that website, thetempleinstitute.org, and you can read all about this. It's fascinating. They have, the, they have the Cohen, the priest prepared. They're trained them. They have all the instruments. They can put this temple together just like that. If Israel can be born a day, the temple can be born in a day also. Now, if you look at a clock, and you've got the hour hand on that clock, and that hour hand is Israel, and Israel is now a nation again. If you look at Jerusalem, it says Jerusalem would be under control of Israel in the last days. In 1967, there was what was called a Six-Day War. In that Six-Day War, Israel claimed Jerusalem again. That's like the men at hand. So the nation's at our hand. Uh, Jerusalem's the men at hand. This temple is the second hand. As you know, the second hand is faster than the men at hand. It's faster than the hour hand. And as things accelerate, it's getting close. That's the second hand, and that's the temple. And that is going to be built. It's fascinating. But then here's the next one. Israel will be invaded in the last days. You watch your news right now. You hear stuff about this. More and more than you did in the past. And Ezekiel, it's called the Ezekiel 38 War. And there's a confederacy of nations. If you study that. And that head, the main nation, which is straight north of, of Jerusalem, is Moscow. And it's called Rosh. And Rosh is Russia. And it says Russia and all these other nations will attack Israel. And the other nations are Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Ethiopia, Libya, Central Asia. And the fascinating thing about this, 20 years ago, these nations were not together at all. Did you know 40, 50 years ago that Turkey was a friend of Israel? And Turkey, the Jews went to Israel for vacation. Uh, Israel went to Turkey to, for vacation at that time. Did you know Iran at one time was an ally of the United States? They were friends. Not anymore. They're all kind of lined up with Russia. They're all Islamic nations, except for Russia. Now, Russia has Islam, and they have uh, Christians in Russia. But basically, Russia is an atheistic nation, isn't it? it? It truly is. But it says Russia with these nations will come upon Israel. They're all in place right now. That's what's fascinating about this. 20 years ago, they really weren't. And so this is developing pretty quick. So that is looking at the nation of Israel. Now let's look at the world, the next one. The world. 
Did you know that there will be some nations that will not participate in this war against Israel, the Ezekiel 38 war? Now, when Russia comes down and these nations come down in Israel, they're going to be supernaturally destroyed. God's going to destroy them, okay? So it's going to be like, uh, they, they're just going to be completely defeated. Now, how this all ties in with the Antichrist and everything is going to be kind, it's kind of fascinating. But there's some nations that will not have anything to do with this attack. And they are Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, the United Arab Emirates. And yet, and there's two other nations, maybe Spain or Britain, which looking at the names of the, uh, the, what's in the Bible and trying to figure out who they are today is not always easy. But they believe it's probably Spain or Britain. And these nations protest. They say, why are you attacking them? But they don't participate in the attack, and they don't defend Israel. So some nations will not be part of this, this attack, and it's amazing that these are the nations, and that's the way it fits in today, too, as this puzzle develops. And it says no superpower will help Israel. Well, three years ago, we would have, right? But today, maybe not so. They say that this present administration is has the worst view of Israel than any previous uh, administration. Uh, George Bush was no lover of Israel. Uh, Barack Obama was no lover of Israel. And now our president, Biden, is no lover of Israel. So there's three possibilities that could happen why we or any other superpower, no other, no other superpower is going to defend Israel. It's always been the United States. Either we're too weakened, and we see that we're falling apart right now because of all the internal upheaval in our nation. And just like the Roman Empire was destroyed internally, maybe that's why the United States will be so weakened. I don't know. I look at it very sadly, but I realize this. I look more toward, hey, Christ is real and in control of all this. And I, don't, I try not to get sad what's going on in our country because this is going to be gone eventually. Uh, so the second thing, we're too weakened. Now, the, the second one is maybe we're not willing to, right? Maybe we say, hey, we're not going to get involved in this battle. We're not going to defend or support Israel. And that's a possibility, right? And I believe that maybe is the most likely scenario. The last one is the one that's kind of the sad one, that we're no longer able to. Possibly we've been destroyed internally or externally. Who knows? There's different scenarios that could happen. But we will not support Israel during this war when Russia and these nations attack Israel according to Ezekiel 38 war. And they believe this is pretty close. It could happen. Now, when I say close, I don't predict the day or the hour or anything like that. Maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe 10 years, who knows, 20 years, I don't know for sure. But I know that the pieces are being fit into place right now, and it's pretty amazing. So the la next one here is there will be a 10-nation European Confederacy. We know that we have the European Union, and that kind of varies between um, eight nations, 14 nations, whatever, and they believe that maybe it's a European Confederacy that's going to develop into this 10-nation Confederacy, that the Antichrist is going to be over. And the Antichrist, as he takes over this revived Roman Empire, will then try to take over the whole world. But he first starts out with his revived Roman Empire. Now, there's other scenarios where they believe that the Western nations will be divided up into ten groups, and that's possibly what's happening. There's some guys that believe that today. I don't know. I can't pick this out, but I know that, hey, this is being worked, developed right now, and we see this with these countries coming together. We see a one-world political and economic system, right? We, want, hey, we need to unite, they say. We need to get together. We need to quit fight, fighting amongst each other. Uh, we need, need to make sure that we have one currency throughout the world. Uh, we need to make sure that we're one world in government. We've got to fight and have world peace and prevent global warming and so on and so on. And that's what they're saying, and we see that developing too. And the la next one here, Babylon will be the world headquarters. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, it talks about Babylon, and it's going to be the headquarters of the Antichrist. Um, some people believe that's going to be Rome because of the city on seven hills, as it talks about in the Bible. Some people believe it could possibly be New York. Do you know just outside New York there's a little city called Babylon? <laughs> It really is. But uh, literal interpretation, it's probably the Babylon that is in Iraq, which is people have a hard time to believe. But if Israel can be born in a day, then the city of Babylon can be born pretty quick in Iraq. And Saddam Hussein, when he was president of Iraq, he poured millions of dollars into rebuilding this city. He never completed it, but it could be rebuilt pretty quick. And this will be the headquarters of the Antichrist in Babylon, Iraq. And I believe that myself personally, although sometimes I bounce back and forth and wonder how could this be. But hey, God's in control and God's doing this, not me. So I think that's fascinating. So um, there's a guy named Dr. Andy Wood who wrote a book about this. And literally he believes that this really is Babylon the capital or the city in Iraq that's going to be the Babylon that we talk about. So, okay, that's talking about the world. Let's now go ahead and look at mankind.
which is our next one. And we're moving her on here pretty quick. I'll try to be done here shortly. But mankind, the world desires a leader. And Daniel 7 talks about this little horn that's going to come up and take over this uh, European Union. The world's in a mess right now. We know it is. Just watch the news networks. The Antichrist, we're going to learn about him when we study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 here shortly and uh, coming up in the next month. And he has all the right characteristics. And you know what? Daniel 11.37 says he'll be an atheist. He won't honor any god. So the Antichrist is going to be an atheist, yet the funny thing is he goes into temple in Jerusalem proclaiming himself as God. That's because he is um, possessed by Satan. And so the world desires a leader. Keep an eye on that. Technology will increase. We have no problem doubting that that's going to happen, right? Um, it, Revelation 11 says that there are two prophets that are laid dead in Jerusalem, Elijah and Enoch, possibly, or maybe Moses, and the whole world will see them. There's a guy named Horatius Boner who wrote a book back in 1847 and says, how could this happen? Is everybody going to go to Jerusalem and see this guy? I mean, it doesn't happen. Today we can, right? We have cameras. We can see somebody clipping their toenails if we wanted to and throughout this world. I mean, anything can happen now, and so they will be seen. And the temple, when it's built, is going to have the, all the modern amenities. It's going to have air conditioning. It's going to have a camera. So Matthew 24, when it talks about the Antichrist going into the temple, everybody will see that. Simple and easy to understand today, isn't it? Would it have been easy to understand 50 years ago? Not so much. What about controlling every human being on the earth? Today with computers, you could do that, right? And you go to a store with your cell phone, and they know where you've been. But when you get, everybody gets uh, identified, and, and I think we're being conditioned right now for that, to be prepared for that. So when the government says, do this, everybody just falls in place like it's n nothing, okay? And so the computers control every human being on this earth pretty easy. We have the technology now. There will be plagues and pestilence, the Bible tells us. Hmm, do I need to talk about this one? Uh, if you see on the screen, there's a book, and I've studied this book. It's 25 Signs, We Are Near the End by Don Stewart. He wrote that in 2017, a fascinating book, and that's where I got a lot of my information from. But Don Stewart said back in 2017, he says, one thing that I see could possibly happen with these plagues is they could create a plague in some uh, laboratory somewhere, and that could be uh, a virus that comes upon this world. Hmm, here we are today, and they're saying it happened over in Wuhan, China. Now, I wasn't there. I don't know, but I listened and I hear people say that stuff, right? So was it or did it? I don't know. But isn't it funny that Don Stewart said this back in 2017 and it happened? So I find that somewhat fascinating. Uh, look at lawlessness will increase throughout the world. It says it'll be like the days of Noah, it'll be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. Riots, looting, it's getting worse. I mean, don't tell me it isn't. Look what happened to Minneapolis a few years ago. Horrible. Um, violence will be rampant in the world. There's mass shootings and so on. Luke chapter 21 verse 1 says that people will be fearful in the last days. It uses this word, Greek word phobiatron, and that means that people will be, have fear pushed upon them. And we're, we fear today. They tell us to fear. They really do. And so that is being fulfilled. Um, thing is, we don't have to be fearful. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I think we get our sound mind by understanding God's book. And that's what we need to do. We need to have our devotions every day. So let's look at the last one here. And this last one is the church. And then we will be finished here in just a few minutes. Now when I talk about the church, please, I'm not trying to say that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. No way am I saying that. Because I have so much to learn. But I say with sadness, there's not a whole lot going on in churches today about talking about the prophecy or giving a clear gospel or anything, and people have this lackadaisical attitude. I mean, it's, it's just, it's pretty bad. And it says the church will be apostate, okay? And the verses I've got there, the clear gospel, everybody adds something to the gospel in almost every church today. They, it's either, it's something to do with you that you have to make yourself saved, you have to do something. You know, you have to turn from your sins, you have to keep yourself serving to prove you're saved, or so on. Whereas the Bible says, the second you place your faith in Christ as personal Savior, He gives you eternal life. And yet nobody believes that, literally. Nobody takes that as face value. People will say, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to prove it, and so on and so on. And they make it complicated. And nobody talks about prophecy today at all, hardly, about what's going on in the Bible. You don't hear that anywhere. Um, in fact, when I search and I go online and I look at YouTube and so on, I see this sermon by Brother Joel Olstein and his most recent sermon, which has, he has, what, how many people in his church? Like 10,000. He has millions and millions of viewers. And he preached a sermon that said, better times are coming. 
delusional, right? How many people fall into that stuff and believe it? I have relatives that believe this stuff. And listen, I don't know if things are going to get better. It doesn't look like it, does it? Keep your eyes open for these things that we're going through here because I believe it's going to be fulfilled according to the way the Bible says it. Now, this should not scare you. Honestly, it shouldn't because you know that God's going to, Jesus is going to come back and the world's going to get worse. So in a sense, we're rather fortunate that we could possibly be that church that gets raptured out of here. My mother-in-law wanted to be part of that group that got raptured. Well, she's up there in heaven right now waiting for us. But, hey, listen, we could be that group. Wouldn't that be cool to think about that? But it says about the apostate. Um, then it says Christians will be persecuted. Uh, Australia, it's happening. Germany, it's happening. Finland, the Bible is now called hate literature, a hate speech work book. Uh, in Canada, it's happening. Things are going on right now. And even in spots of the United States. So Christians will be persecuted. Believe me, it's going to come to help hurt, hurting this Christianity in this world. Now, we'll be taken out of here before the wrath of God is poured out in this world. And I believe that literally. So we won't be here during the tribulation. But unbelievers will scoff at true Christianity. Now, I want to tell you something about this one because I found this is something fascinating. Most people don't believe in the rapture anymore. I believe literal interpretation Bible talks about the rapture. Most people do not believe in um, creationism. They believe in theistic evolution or evolution in science, science, science. You hear that? We only believe the science. And so people are disbelieving the Bible today. But I thought it was fascinating that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says there will be mockers in the last days, right? Mockers in the last days. Now here, what's fascinating. Verse 8, remember the verse when Peter said uh, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is what, like one day? Why did Peter use that terminology? Think about this. Think about this. Remember the 400 silent years after Malachi and then Matthew? And now we've had, what, 2,000 years since Christ has been here on this earth? Isn't it funny that Peter says one day is like a thousand years, thousand years is like one day? Now, this is somewhat speculation, but is that because God gave a hint that it would be a thousand years? God wants to save as many people as he can in this world. But I th when I read that, I look at it and I say, one day is like a thousand years, thousand years. And, and, and what has it been? It's been 2,000 years. I think that is kind of interesting, at least, to look at that and think about that. That 2,000 years now, and in God's eyes, it's been a short time period. And yet Christ will come back for his church. So we'll finish up here in just a second. It says the wicked will not understand, and mostly most of the church will not understand. They know something's going on, but they really don't understand it. Just like the Pharisees knew that Christ would be born in Bethlehem, but it really didn't mean much to them. But searching believers will understand. In fact, in Daniel, it tells you that if you look up them verses later, we try, we research, we try to understand as much as we can. But these 20 items that I gave, uh, about 16, 17 of them haven't been fulfilled yet. Um, keep your eyes on these and think about these as you go to your day-to-day -day listening to news and what's going on and, and see what you hear because you'll find that things are happening in this world. Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to continue to look for him. If you haven't trusted him as your personal Savior, I plead with you that you do before it's too late. You don't want to go through this tribulation time period. And so please, we need to make sure that we do know Jesus Christ is a Savior. As the verse behind me tells you, it's all by grace and it's all by faith. It's not by works. So let's go ahead and close in prayer and we will have our final hymn. Most precious Heavenly Father, we come before you thank you for that Jesus was a baby and he was born as it said he would and when he was born as it said the Bible said he would. And everything that we see in this, as we study today, is absolutely amazing. And help us to look at the things that are going to happen in the future that point toward the second coming of Christ and knowing that the rapture occurs before that, so it's got to be closer. Just as when we see Christmas ornaments being put up and, and Christmas is coming, we know that Thanksgiving will be here shortly. In the same way as we see the things that are ramping up toward what's going to take place during this tribulation time period, we know that the rapture occurs before that, so we're getting closer every single day. And just pray, Lord, that we would be here on this earth and remember you and put you first and live for you the best we can. Pray that everyone has a wonderful, glorious Christmas and a wonderful thanks, thankfulness of be the new year that will be coming up here soon. And pray that God blesses everyone here this morning and your Holy Spirit just will be with us and teach us and instruct us and help us to know more and more about your word and protect us from the evil that is throughout this world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.